Well, greetings once again, poetry lovers. Uh, today, we are going to, this is going to be our first, um, uh, first installment of video lessons regarding T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So you're going to want to take some notes on this. Um, there's not enough space in the book for me to put all the notes in here. Um, this is considered the, uh, the first modern work. It is, uh, takes the form of a, uh, a dramatic monologue, but really it's probably more uh, accurately described as an internal monologue. This is a guy talking to himself. And even though he might be imagining that he's talking to someone else, um, probably a woman, uh, it's, it's him talking to himself. And, and you, you should be at least marginally familiar with this. Uh, if you've ever had to rehearse uh, what you're going to say to someone, you know, you're, um, uh, you're in trouble, you got to you know, face moms and pops or, or whomever, and uh, like, what am I going to say? Um, if you want to ask a, um, um, you know, a girl out on a date, you're, you're thinking to yourself, well, what am I going to, you know, what am I going to say? Um, in advance of it to sound see if in your head it sounds right and and also you know you debate with yourself and this is part of what's happening in this particular poem okay so um, in addition to the this internal monologue and what makes it work is that he's employing the stream of consciousness technique you should be familiar with this from your study last year but um, it, it provides a, a heightened sense of realism uh, quite often to the uh, so if you read this on your own it's it's going to be confusing in places because if you got inside somebody else's head and tried to decipher the things that they are saying uh, to themselves, y you can't because you don't have the context for uh, for what it is that they are uh, thinking and feeling and and so forth. Um, that said, that's what makes it super realistic, and you know the the, the poem itself really then is uh, is a distinctly modernist work. Because it seeks to break with the with the forms, traditions, ideas of the past, and push into something else. So we talked about um, Gerard Manley Hopkins' poetry being the bridge between the Victorians and the modern era, with his experimentation with language and rhythms of speech, and things of that nature. Um, Eliot then, through his uh, his study at Harvard, um, he enters Harvard I think around 1906, and um, uh, he begins study under a guy named T. E. Hume, uh, Hume, who introduces him to this concept of of imagism, and so imagism here then is um, is what informs um, his uh, his technique called the objective correlative. So let me tell you what imagism is first. So imagism is is a reactionary movement against uh, romantic and Victorian poetry against the, Victoria, the, the Romantic Age and Victorian Age. Uh, so it emphasizes simplicity, clarity of expression, and, and precision through the use of exacting visual images. This is show versus tell. You've heard me say this to you in your, in your writing, uh, that you want to show what a thing looks like, especially in the narrative and descriptive. Um, be, allow the reader to to picture what it is that you're talking about instead of trying to tell them about an abstraction like beauty or uh, or in a case of a poem uh, frustration anger anxiety uh, these sorts of things so objective correlative is um, as the word objective suggests it's it's about an object correlative means how it relates to what what does the object do in the service of uh, the poet. In essence, an object, usually placed in a scene, sets the emotional tone for, in, this, in the case of this poem, a speaker, uh, or maybe the entire piece, or a portion of the entire piece, which is what happens here. So then rather having to be explicit about, uh, about the emotion you want to convey, you let the object do the work for you. If I want to express a, a sense of, um, of loss, it's maybe um, a, a, a single baby shoe on the side of the road. Um, or the, you know, the, the world's shortest short story, uh, a sign in front of a house that says, uh, baby shoes for sale, never worn. 
All right, there's a lot that's packed into um, into that. So, okay. All right, so um, I think that um, anything else is maybe maybe this just before I read the poem. Uh, the speaker is a um, um, is a thinker and not a feeler, which explains his indecision. And you should also get echoes of Hamlet. The poem, of course, alludes to Hamlet in several places. And so be thinking about, about the things that bothered Hamlet. Uh, they, they, these are similar things that bother Prufrock. So let's, let's read through it. I'm going to read it faster than, um, uh, than Eliot reads it when he reads his own work. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. Let us go then, you and I. When the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells. Streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask. What is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions and a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare, and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voice is dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? Now I've known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I'm pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I've known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows? I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. In the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, 
have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here is no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all? Would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern through the nerves and patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince. No doubt, an easy tool deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think, think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. All right, so let's take a look at, um, at the opening here. And um, uh, of particular note, let's, uh, let's look at the, uh, at the title. So the title then, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So it begins then with the juxtaposition of uh, juxtaposition is going to feature prominently in the poem, and the title itself is uh, is the first indication of that. Okay, so love song is something that um, that is seemingly romantic, and yet it's the love song of a dude named J. Alfred Prufrock. Okay, so Eliot uh, remarks on this and says that he wanted to to select the most prosaic name he could think of, although of course he is in possession of about as prosaic a name as you can get. Thomas Stearns Eliot. I mean, come on, bro. So, um, so you've got this uh, this sense of things in the opening, all right? Now, the let's take a look at the epigraph. So, an epigraph, denotatively, is some uh, some matter that lives between the title and the main body of the work, and generally, its its purpose is to uh, is to establish some sense of something, perhaps set the tone. And so what you've got is this, um, this passage from uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Okay, and it's the piece, um, it's in three parts, and this is called the Inferno. So it's when uh, Dante is, um, uh, is journeying through hell. And while he's there, uh, he meets a, uh, a man, Guido da Montefeltro, who is... Uh, 
is enclosed in a flame, so he's eternally burning. And what he says to Dante is that, um, you know, if I thought that there was any chance, I'm, I'm glossing here, if I thought there was any chance that you could return to Earth, um, I wouldn't tell you my story. But since nobody has ever returned from here, um, I can, I'll, I'll speak to you without fear of, uh, of, of my shameful life being revealed. Okay? So, the connection then is that what's going to happen is just as de Montefeltro uh, reveals his evil, shameful life to Dante, then Prufrock is going to reveal his own version of hell to us. Okay? All right. Uh, let's see. So, if we take a look at the, at the opening, and um, so we've got, Let us go then. You and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. So I've got a, a, a visual image here. This is the London skyline that we're talking about. So if you can see here, um, the etherized patient. So what I want you to notice is the progression of imagery. I'm not going to talk to you about a lot of the, um, uh, the, the, the technical elements, uh, acoustics and, and whatnot, some but not too much. Um, more interested in, in the imagery, the types and classifications. So the, the skyline with its contours is supposed to look like someone laid out on a, on a table. It cannot escape your notice then that a patient etherized upon a table is, is undergoing some sort of surgery. And back then, the only time that surgery was attempted, if something was badly wrong, if that person was gravely ill, uh, and they would put them under, uh, under an anesthesia, Ether, as you probably know, is not particularly stable, and uh, lots of people died on the operating table because they were given too much ether or, uh, or what have you. Because the thing you don't want is to uh, not have put the person under enough that they that they wake up when you start, you know, hacking into them with a scalpel. Okay, so uh, what I want you to to, to, to point out is, is this going to begin the the opening uh, stanza is a sonnet essentially. It's a sonnet length. And it is uh, in rhymed couplets, for the most part. And the uh, the idea here is is that it is the is providing the link between the speaker and and whoever it is that he's addressing, which uh, for the most part is us. Okay. Now, one thing I want you to remember as we're as we're going in through the poem, and you should have already heard this, um, because there's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 questions that he asks over the po uh, over the course of the poem, and. Just remember that, that it was Hamlet's customary form of expression in the play was the question, the interrogative. And so just if you look at how many questions Prufrock asks, it's largely because, and these are, these are for the most part rhetorical questions, there's no answer. He's asking them as though somehow hearing them um, stated out loud is going to, uh, to help him to answer them. But you're going to find that he is unable to do so. Okay, so the images then are um, the, the progression of them goes from general to specific and also from horizon to the floor. Um, although he'll deal with this topic more in his, uh, his famous poem called The Wasteland, this, this imagery is supposed to mirror uh, society's decline on, on kind of a macro level, but on a micro level as it has to do with him. It's it's the decline in his in his confidence, his belief in uh, his place in the world. Okay, uh, etherized again means to be uh, rendered unconscious, um, or to be insensible to pain from surgery. And this guy's experiencing a good deal of pain. Okay, so um, so then if you say, uh, let us go uh, through certain half deserted streets. Uh, notice it's not uh, not half crowded or peopled streets, so he takes the, the sort of negative aspect there. Um, it's half deserted. Um, okay, so the uh, let us go through the, the the muttering retreats. So we've got the the visual image of the patient etherized upon a table, and also of course there's the in a sense the tactility of it um, of how the body feels when when it is uh, anesthetized. Uh, we have the auditory, uh, implied auditory image of the muttering retreat. Notice how often there, there are elements of indistinctness 
uh, murmuring, muttering, uh, the inability to really hear what someone is saying, and in finding out what it is they mean regarding things. Okay, so here's the um, uh, uh, the business with the. I hope that didn't go blank for you. Uh, the business with the the, the rhyme couplets. Okay. Um, here's our second question here at line 11. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. So here's the showing versus the telling. Okay. Now, this refrain line that that appears a couple of times. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. So Michelangelo is a uh, is an Italian Renaissance sculptor, poet, architect, uh, painter, um, and um, his his art. Um, I mean, he exerted unparalleled, unprecedented influence on the art world of his time. He actually had two biographies written about him uh, during his life. But then beyond that is the the um, uh, the influence that he had on on Western art in general. Okay, so um, maybe the question that the women are asking, and and they're they're never no one's ever named. It's just generally women. Okay, as though they're all the same in the mind of the of the speaker, um, and and you wonder if they're asking, are there any Renaissance men, uh, men of of multiple talents that are in these rooms that we're going into? Um, and probably not. Okay, so um, if you take, so here's our, our nice visual and tactile image that um, uh, that plays together so nicely. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes. So this is, uh, without question, um, an implied metaphor for a cat. All right, so it licks its tongue into the corners of the evening. So notice here we've got more images of decline lingered upon the pools that stand and drain. So water's running downhill, and it's not it's not pretty water. Um, and, and drains are for wastewater, uh, water runoff. Uh, let's go ahead and notice the, uh, we've got a new term for you. Um, and it's epistrophe, E-P-I-S-T-R-O-P-H-E. It is the opposite of anaphora. So if you know that anaphora then is the repetition of words or um, short words at the beginnings of um, phrases, clauses, sentences um, in close succession, you see how much, uh, how often he uses figures of repetition in the poem because it's the sense that he keeps doing the same thing over and over and over and makes no progress. It's another one of the, the, the images that you should note is, is sort of regression uh, and digression, okay? So, so there's the, the, the business about the cat's back, it's back, the soot that falls from chimneys, so the blackness then um, is suggestive of something that's repulsive. Slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap. Notice where it's a soft October night. Again, a, a, um, a month of decline. It's autumn, uh, declining toward the bleakness and coldness of winter. All right. Um, let's see. So the the number of allusions in the um, uh, in the poem uh, significant uh, to other works of fiction. So of course we've got the Dante reference, and then we've got the references to uh, to Hamlet. And here we've got an allusion to, uh, if you'll recall, uh, Andrew Marvell's uh, poem to his coy mistress, uh, Had We But World Enough and Time. So notice this is a good example of epimony. Indeed, there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back along the window panes. There will be time, there will be time. So this is, this is an echo. So we have an, an allusion to Ecclesiastes Book 3. Which is, you know, there's a time for everything, you know, uh, reap, sow, harvest, you know, whatever. Um, but the the book of Ecclesiastes in the beginning is that everything is meaningless, and so it's it, this is no accident, of course, that he's uh, he's uh, alluding to Ecclesiastes because the first two books are about the meaninglessness of things that are material in the world, okay. Um, and and I've marked some of the um, you know some of the rhyme scheme business here. Um, it's you should notice just the, there's lots of chiming that happens with respect to the rhymes at the ends of lines and rhymes occur in various uh, various places. Notice again the um, the juxtaposition of things like murder and create. Okay, 
So time for all the works and days of hands. Um, uh, th this is uh, an allusion that, that your note tells you to uh, a poem about the farming year by the Greek poet uh, Hesiod. Uh, so he's contrasting that, that uh, useful architectural labor with the feudal works and days of hands engaged in, in the meaningless social gesturing that you have to do if you want to, if you want to survive. Those of you that are planning perhaps on, uh, on joining a fraternity in college, uh, I just remember this uh, for myself. You, you learn really quickly, like, uh, what, what, what do you do and what you, don't you do in, in those contexts, especially if it's a, like a mixer with a sorority. Um, I mean, you just sort of, I remember as a freshman, like looking around and seeing what the older guys were doing and how they were, you know, uh, like managing uh, the women because I'd never been in social search situations like that when I was in high school. Um, there were no things like that. I mean, maybe it was because I was a dork and didn't go to parties, but, but it, it's sort of like that, okay? Um, this, this social gesturing. Okay, so all the, the business of, of the hundred visions and revisions. Okay, so you know that this is uh, polyptaton. Okay, so it's the, it's the suggestion then of can you revise something that's already been said or already been done? And the answer is generally no. So you've got to make the, the, the right move the first time in order to... Um, uh, to be successful in a social circumstance. Okay, so here we have the repetition then of our refrain lines. Again, they keep, they come and go, they come and go. All right, and indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Do I dare to do this thing? And, and if I've, I've now envisioned what it is that I want to do, can I do it? And, and, and a lot of this has to do, I read some interesting essays about this, um, about this poem, and one that talks about the fact that, you know, um, what, what Eliot is responding to is, is the repressed sexuality that was uh, so prominent in the Victorian era, uh, that, that, that you were supposed to repress your sexual urges, and, um, you know, this is, if you know anything about uh, uh, graham crackers, so there's a man named, uh, a doctor, last name of Graham, who suggested that you should eat graham flour as a, um, uh, as a way to, uh, for women in particular. Women were absolutely supposed to repress their, uh, their sexual desires. And so men knowing this um, were then, you know, uh, standoffish as well. Okay, so, so now that, do I turn, time to turn my back and descend the stairs? We have another image of decline here with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. So here's, a, again, middle-aged guy, and he is reminded continually of, of, the, of his mortality and the fact that he is aging, okay? Uh, they will say, and this is the women, how his hair is growing thin, doesn't look like he used to. And, and, and so is he a, uh, an attractive and eligible mate for them, someone that they want to associate themselves with for the rest of their lives if he's already this old? Um, and so my morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin. So he is a buttoned up dude dressed in a hyper, um, you know, formal way, probably off-puttingly formal. So my necktie rich, this is, this is a tactile image of, by rich you're talking about the, the type of material, it's probably silk, but it's modest. So it's not a, a gaudy color like Oscar Wilde would have worn, uh, but it's, it's just something that would be, um, you know, understated and conservative but asserted by a simple pen. It's funny that, that you have the idea of, of assertiveness that is, is with, the, uh, with the pen, because the pen is gonna make an appearance here when he sees himself as an insect uh, about to be, um, you know, again, you have to, if you know how to, uh, how to go about uh, mounting insects for display, you're supposed to put them in, like, uh, deaden them through through the use of like alcohol in a, in a, in a bottle or something like that to uh, to kill them before you stick them with the pen. So this is sort of what's happening here. And they'll, they're again are going to comment about how his um, his arms and legs are thin. Okay, now, do I dare disturb the universe? So once again, this is the um, uh, this, this is the, the, the drawing room as the microcosm of the rest of English society. And you got to understand that that Although Eliot went over to England, um, you know, he, he married an English woman. Um, she was like mentally unstable. She ended up being committed to um, to a mental hospital where she died like 17 years later. Um, but he tried so hard to fit in 
to he was an Anglophile who loved England. Now he he was an American citizen for half his life, and the other half he was a, a, a British subject. Um, I mean he naturalized to England, so this is why he appears in in the American anthologies and the English anthologies. And although the Americans claim him, he he claimed himself as an Englishman. So, but even as that, he just didn't fit in because they knew he was American, and it's just tough. Um, in as as buttoned up as English society is for them to accept somebody new, hmm, not happening. So you've got the nice rhythm here uh, for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. Uh, you've got the epimony here of I have known them all already, known them all, have known. So how often that that word known appear, appears, known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. So notice the, um, okay, here's our example then of what? A syndeton. Probably going to ask you a question about that. So a syndeton is... Items in a series that are separated by commas and, and they it lacks the terminal conjunction. You know that the idea behind that is to speed it up. I've measured my out my life with coffee spoons. The idea here is that he's been to so many of these um, these tea parties that um, he doesn't count time in terms of minutes past, but how many cups of tea has he consumed? Okay. All right. Uh, I know the voice is dying with a dying fall. Um, this this is a reference to uh, Count Orsino in um, in Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night. Um, and so Count Orsino is seen as the archetypal Petrarchan lover um, who is just uh, unfulfilled in every way uh, until the end of the play. Okay. Uh, beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? So, so meaning uh, to presume means to, to undertake to do something without clear justification or, or reason. Uh, think of it this way. It's like if you're you know, wanting to kiss someone uh, romantically, um, you're, you're constantly reading the signs to see if it's appropriate to do this or not, right? I mean, cause you don't want to, to surprise this person and have, uh, have them so, you know, sort of reject you. So you're constantly having to, uh, to navigate uh, the, the cues that they're giving you, okay? Uh, let's see. So remember the, um, uh, the, the, the business here with the, um, the, the music from a farther room. Uh, there's this sense of, um, of the murmuring, like the muttering in line five that's indistinct and unintelligible. Okay, so uh, I've known them, the eyes already, known them all. So this, this repetition, uh, again, suggests sort of the fruitlessness of his task. Formulated phrase, when I am formulated, so notice some meaning changes here. Sprawling on a pin, and when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall. So you've got the polyptaton, which emphasizes that he feels less human, um, not even animal, he's an insect. Then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? Again, um, the, the idea of being cast off, okay? And how should I presume? And yet another question. So here we go again with this um, the, the, the anaphoric phrase of I've known them all, known this, known that, known the arms already, known them all. Arms that are braceleted and white and bare. So we have the polysyndeton here, um, which accentuates the interminable sameness of the scene, the women, their conversation. Okay, it's all they they all talk about the same thing over and over and over, and and it suggests something about the. Um, um, you know this false intellectual power of the women that they they only talk about the things that are you're supposed to talk about not trivialities okay we're talking about a renaissance painter sculptor and whatever okay um so you've got these marvelous um uh, little parentheticals where he is is sort of uh, revealing uh emotion uh ekphonesis then is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Again, that, uh, that rhetorical question. Um, arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. So notice how they're disembodied. There's no sense of, uh, of the woman uh, in speaking in direct address. Again, because they all run together for him. All right? And then how, and how 
and, and should I then presume? And how should I begin? Like, you know, how do I get into this? All right, I'm going to stop the, um, the, the tape now and, um, um, and then start the next one beginning at this line uh, at line 70.